Hello, my friends. This is Andy over at Falco Canine Academy. Welcome uh, to our show here at uh, 7 o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time. I'm here in Brea, California, uh, where our, uh, our, main, uh, our main location is uh, for Falco Canine Academy. Uh, over the years, we've had locations all over the place. We've had them uh, and still have one in uh, Argentina with our trainer, Aldo Secchi, uh, in Orange County. We also have uh, Falco Dog Training. Um, pet dog training, uh, who uh, is run by Gina. Uh, we've had uh, training facilities in Northern Ireland. And uh, where else? I know that we've had them in other places. Oh, uh, Puerto Rico. <laughs> I can't even remember where we've had locations. <laughs> but we're all over the place. And so uh, that if you're wondering, why does he always say he's from Brea? Well, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, at least we're talking from Brea. I know we rarely talk from other places. But if you're on the Spanish version of Falco K9 Academy called Falco K9 Academia, uh, then uh, you'll find that Aldo Secchi uh, there in Argentina speaks from uh, uh, from there quite often and, and shows pictures and videos of that kind of stuff. So that's why I say that. Uh, it is snowing here in Brea, California. No, it's not. This is a part of our app. Uh, and while my co-host to my podcast called Train the Dog Trainer is not here, Cam Thompson, um, she thinks that the, the snowflakes are a little cheesy. So while she was not on the show, because she may come on a little bit later on, I wanted to get the snowflakes in and the little Christmas look. Uh, but uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, uh, and uh, whatever other uh, holiday that you want to call uh, this period of time uh, of the year. Uh, welcome, and I hope you have a great one, whatever it is that you're celebrating. So let me go ahead and get rid of the snow. Uh, and get rid of the uh, uh, the frame there. Get rid of Santa Claus. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, training from a place of calm, and it's uh, uh, it's something that really kind of came out of our training over the last couple of days. Uh, uh, I have Greg, who is here from San Francisco, training with Charlie the Bed Bug Dog. Some of you watched the progress of, uh, of Charlie uh, over the last uh, couple months, and so yes, now the handler's here. He's been here all week. Uh, we've been working at the uh, at our training locations, and uh, we also have Cher with her dog, uh, Blue, Blue-O, no, Blue, I forget his name. I'm just going to call him Blue. There's something else that goes with that Blue, uh, but he's a very strong German Shepherd. You've seen also videos of him at work, and super strong, big dog, and uh, uh, there is a theme with um, kind of both of them uh, that, that it kind of uh, created the need I felt for uh, doing this broadcast uh, in regard to training dogs that uh, your training needs to start uh, from a place of calm. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about aggressive dogs or uh, dogs with just simple bad behavior or just trying to simply train uh, obedience. So we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about that. Um, I want to um, uh, talk about, uh, for, oh, first, I'm sorry. I almost always forget this. Uh, but first, Falco Canine Academy, we want to welcome you. Thank you. I had that on there, so I want to push the button, make sure you see it. Uh, but the next thing is, uh, as usual, uh, I talk about this training report that if you're watching for the first time, I know we had a lot of first-time uh, viewers uh, from the last show in regard to the uh, the pit bull, uh, the two pit bulls that uh, took down uh, their owner, and, uh, and she's deceased now because of uh uh, more than likely the dogs uh, killed her, but uh, uh, we've had quite, quite a number of viewers watching that. So I know we had uh, new viewers. So just in case you are um, uh, one of those new viewers, uh, make sure. Hey, Gina, Gina, both Gina and Derek are watching. Where are you watching from? Uh, maybe I don't want to know where you're watching from. Uh, Whole Foods, uh, maybe, or some other um, location like that. All right. So here's uh, the link where you uh, just click on that. You put your name and email address in there and you'll get a free report on training with love and respect. Uh, it's also a way that we can communicate you uh, with you in the future because we have a couple things planned. Gina and I have been talking along with Cam uh, about uh, a, uh, a, 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 an obedience competition. It's a friendly competition. There will be some prizes and things that we're planning on giving away. Uh, but we're just in the very beginning stages of developing uh, what it is we're going to do for that competition. Uh, what else is going to be at the, you know, during the day, if there's going to be vendors, if there's going to be even a, um, uh, maybe a workshop the day before or something like that. Those are some of the things, uh, uh, the ideas. Oh, Derek is not watching. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Hi, it's Gina. Wait a minute. And Derek watching. We are at my house. Sorry. I'm reading the comments here. Uh, and Derek is not watching. What is he watching? Uh, I, I'm confused, <laughs> but that's okay. That's not unusual. All right, so uh, Gina, you know what? I'm going to put the link uh, to be able to come on live if uh, if anybody wants to come on live. Uh, uh, I've sent the 
um, the link out. So this link that you're going to see in the comments, uh, if you're watching live and you're on the Falco Canon Academy page, you can click on that link and actually come on camera uh, with your mic and your camera. Just make sure it's working well and you're not backlit so we can see your face and that kind of stuff. But feel free to pop on. And if you want to join the discussion, you're more than welcome to join. If not, no big deal. Just make sure you comment and hit some hearts and things like that so we can see uh, that you're actually paying attention to what it is we're talking about. And, and feel free to, if you disagree, then... Um, Oh, that was him being a smart. Okay. <laughs> what? Derek being a smart, uh, a smart aleck? No, I don't believe it. Derek is watching. All right. So, um, uh, so the free report, if you are watching for the first time, if you want to connect with us, if you want to get maybe an email that just tells you about what's going on, we're not going to be selling you something every minute. We're not going to sell it off to some Viagra uh, corporation that sends you messages every uh, you know couple hours. No, it is just for us uh, to both give you the report and then to uh, tell you about some things we might have in, uh, coming up that you may be interested in. So uh, please um, go ahead and use that link, put your name and email address in there. And in the future, you may get an email uh, from us uh, talking about something that we have going on. All right, so uh, one thing I wanna, I was hoping that Cam would be on when I talk about this, but I wanna uh, show you, uh, oh, here comes Gina. All right, so uh, oh, what's Derek doing? <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you're not seeing this right now. Uh, <laughs> all right. So what I want to talk about is the Train the Dog Trainer Show. Before I bring on Gina, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Train the Dog Trainer Show and uh, let you know where you can find it. Uh, you know what? I have to bring them on. They, well, hold on. He's going to come up. Three. Uh-oh. Sorry. I clicked on the wrong thing. Wait a minute. Sorry. My bad. Now you should see. Three, two, one. I'm not watching. There we go. Why? Why? <laughs> I'm proud to say that these are two of the best trainers in the in the whole world, our pet dog trainers. Uh, they are uh, the masters of pet dog training and our group training classes and our privates and our uh, in homes and board and train. So uh, when you want your dog trained uh, well and you want to save your dog from uh, any, you know, having to be adopted out, come come to us and uh, Gina and Derek will help you out. All right. So back to the Train the Dog Trainer podcast first. I just wanted you to see these two. These, they, they, now they're being calm and they're not, they're not acting the way they were earlier, but actually Derek. But uh, you can find our Train the Dog Trainer podcast. on. There we go. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to put the, uh, the link that you can find the Train the Dog Trainer podcast, and that's <laughs> iHeartRadio. Um, and, our, and our Facebook page. I'm going to go ahead and throw in here too. And you can find it there. Hold on, coming up. And there's a link in the comment section. So go ahead and click on those and be a part of those. If you're a dog trainer or interested in being a dog trainer, you're gonna definitely wanna be a part of, uh, of both those things, the podcast and the Facebook page. So uh, Derek and Gina, what's happening? What's happening over there in the pet dog world over at uh, Falco Canine Dog Training? Not much. Um, really, we're just trying to uh, help people out with their dogs. Um, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah. What are we? Oh, been your hands doing? are clammy. That's rude. <laughs> well, what have we been doing lately, Gina? Uh, geez, we're actually having a little break right now, which is the holiday break. My Saturday. Yeah, he gets to sleep in this Saturday. Yeah. Well, no, not really. I've I've got an in-home board and train, but uh, yeah, we started a new program. Yeah. What's pilot? We're doing a pilot program. It's an in-home. Well, we can't say board and train, but in-home, in I come home. to your house and help you train. Yeah, but it's like a. It's treated like a board and train. Yeah, pretty much. I come by a couple of times a day um, while the owner still gets to keep the dog, which is kind of why we say board and train because it, it splinters off from the regular boot camp program that we have, the regular board and train. But now, what I'm trying to work out right now, and that's why I say pilot, is I'm trying to go out to a customer's house twice a day. Um, our day and work on some of the things you wanted to. And the reason why we're doing um, uh, this new pro service dog need. So she wants to be able to get her dog to bond with her while she does this process. It's a great day. Cool. Great puppy. I hate to tell you this, but you guys get need to get a little bit closer because when I go to uh, the dual thing there, so go back a little bit and then a little bit cheek to cheek. Not a lot like that. Oh, oh. <laughs> Okay. No, I see. Oh, I see. Like that? Yeah. There you go. There you go. There should be like little lines that show you where your faces need yeah. to be. Yes. We, we see there it. You. Yeah. Yep. He keeps on um, trying to move. 
so uh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to probably drop you down uh, from time to time, but stay on because I want to make sure and get everybody in here. It's going to be a little bit difficult to have two of you on the same camera, but, you know, we'll make it work. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, starting from a place of calm when training your dog. And one of the things that we start off with in our pet dog training is we actually hardly move on the very first day, right? We stand there, the dog's supposed to sit, and we start from a place of calm. And this constantly comes into play when I'm helping people with their dogs, regardless of uh, detection dog or protection dog or what have you. You guys are very distracting. I'm going to continue to look at the camera and not look at the screen. Um, also, um, unfortunately, my button to bring on the agenda has gone away, so I can't get rid of that lower third right now for some reason. So hopefully... I, I have no idea why that's happening right now, but I can't seem to get rid of it. I'm going to bring on Cam here. Cam, you ready to go? Uh-oh. Sure uh-oh. Really? <laughs> Who's Cam? Cam. Oh, here we go. We're going to have all three of you. Hey, Cam. <laughs> Derek has not met Cam. <laughs> no. Wow, hey. you look you look very What's Christmassy up? back there with your, with your Christmas cozy. tree. It's Christmas, so I'm in front of the tree. It made sense, right? <laughs> it does. You know I'm what? I'm going to try. This is great. Good. You know, this is going to be very weird, but I'm going to leave the broadcast for a second and refresh my screen because all my buttons have disappeared. I can't click on that. That's anything. fine. We don't need you anyway. So, it's fine. That's all right. <laughs> they all, you know, you know what? Yeah. All right. It's we funny because it's true. We got it's, this. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to go away for a second, but both of you uh, stay on this. Every, everything okay. should continue to work. Hey, what was like, he even talking about? He was trying to talk um, about starting from a place of calm, but I joined in and you guys were talking about service dogs. Was this like oh, a study? Yeah, we're doing a uh, an in home kind of board and train program where we the dog stays at home with the the owner, and we go oh, in and cool. do we do a two hour training a day, one in the morning, one at night with the owners because um it's wow. a puppy. Yeah, it's a puppy, awesome. so we want to make sure that the dog bonds with the owner. So, so awesome! It's, yeah, it's our first time we've done it, so we're really excited. That oh, and this is, so is Derek. Cool. Sam, this is Derek. This is hey, Derek. Nice Cam. to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah, that's fantastic. What a cool strategy for yeah. you know getting them the information and the support they need to create foundation and really get launched off on the right foot, but not lose that dynamic of bonding. I think that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah, especially because yeah. the dog's not even uh, 18 weeks old yet. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Way to go, guys. Yeah. Even outside the box. Right? <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, that's I don't like change. That's why Gina's here. <laughs> so, no. so Gina and Derek, I'm gonna, Gina and Derek, I'm going to drop you down for just one second, but don't go anywhere. Andy thinks he can regain control of his show. I can. I'm going to regain funny. control. No. <laughs> there, they're gone. They're gone. So, Cam, how are you? Great, thanks. How are it you? It seems like we were. We, it seems like we were just talking to each other. We kind of were. We just recorded a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic podcast that we should charge money for, but we're not going to. And uh, yes. it was totally worth me like grabbing dinner, inhaling it, and then sitting back down to chat about so we could make sure that everybody knew to eagerly anticipate our, uh, our podcast that's coming up. So totally glad to be able to continue the conversation. Yep. So uh, the Train the Dog Trainer podcast is to help anybody that either currently is a dog trainer or is thinking about being a, being a dog trainer to not only be good at training dogs, but to successfully run a dog training business. Would you agree? That's pretty much is the synopsis of what we want to do there. Yeah. And to just generally become more kick-ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're developing people, right? I mean, they yes. happen to be dog trainers, but we're really developing people. So not only are we talking about business and real world strategy and, you know, the mechanics and dynamics of what goes on in our industry, but also like what are the missing pieces that they need to understand about themselves, what's reflected in their business and their entrepreneurial endeavor, and then, um, you know, also to really help them to expand their view of what's possible in this industry because so many get into it thinking they have to trade their time for dog, you know, interactions and uh, that they're really limited to the number of sessions they can fit in a day or what have you. And in reality, as you and I have both discovered, it's so much bigger than that. And that's really exciting. Yeah. And, and, and also the power of no. Did you mention that? That, that I, we're going to teach you I how did. to say no. <laughs> it, it's probably no, one of the most important I things not, I learned. Because we're saving that one for later. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. That's going to be an episode. So up to this point, up to until tomorrow, uh, uh, all the, the Train the Dog Trainer podcasts that are up are me solo, but they're going to become much smarter and uh, much more uh, entertaining uh, with the addition of my co-host here, Cam. 
And so starting tomorrow, you'll you'll be able to listen to that, the newest podcast that we're going to put up there. There also is new artwork, which we uh, I thought was fantastic. But apparently, <laughs> Cam has her own ideas about what the artwork should look like. But uh, for a while, we're going to have new artwork. You'll be able to see Cam on the artwork there. And uh, we're going to be rolling out this new show uh, as, 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 you know, piece by piece, but as, as quickly as we can. And that includes also the Train the Dog Trainer uh, Facebook page where Cam will be a, an administrator very shortly as soon as I make her one. Whoa. And we'll, be begin, we'll begin to Look add uh, content. <laughs> yeah, we'll begin to add content to the Train the Dog Trainer uh, podcast. So uh, really important. I'm also looking down here. At, I'm not sure that I could ever bring Gina and Derek back on. Because I can't they are see doing, them right now, but I can only uh, imagine. <laughs> I'm not even sure I want to even tackle that. <laughs> All right. So we let's get to control. one other thing. Before we get to uh, starting from a place of calm, I want to um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the show that I did the other day about the, the pit bull attack uh, revisited just a, a little bit. Uh, one of the things that somebody brought up in one of the comments was about, were, you know, did I have knowledge whether or not the dogs were neutered? And um, I don't. Um, my feelings on neutering is that, um, and again, uh, I don't know everything about um, uh, Cam yet, so uh, there's a, a, a good chance that he, sh he, she and I <laughs> may, may not agree on something. There's a few things you need to understand about <laughs> neutering that I can tell right off the bat are really important. <laughs> that, yes, well, uh, that she, that she and I may not agree on, and that's okay, and I, and I really, I, I don't mind at all. I love having discussions where we can have one point of view and another point of view, but uh, my feelings on neutering is that it doesn't, it's not the end all be all on solving aggression. It is not the end all be all on, on even solving the fact that what your dog may be humping you or your other dog. Um, it, it is one of those things I think that needs to be done because uh, cancer is one of the leading cause of deaths in dog. And that's one way of preventing that one way. And uh, also we have too many dogs on this planet. <laughs> and so it's important to neuter your dog. But in the, in the sense that it would have made a difference in this pit bull issue, I don't think that that necessarily would have been made any different. You still have genetics involved. And when you take off the testicles, you're not changing the dog's genetics. You're just changing uh, a, a small aspect of, of, of what the dog, sometimes it slows the dog down. Sometimes it slows down, down metabolism. So dogs get heavy and fat. Um, and so those things do happen, but I'm not sure it would have changed anything. How do you feel uh, about that, uh, Cam? I think it takes the edge off, right? So <laughs> ultimately... Um, you know, for the majority of dogs that we see that come into training or rescues and shelters, can, you know, speaking to the nonprofit side of things that I do here in terms of dog rescue, um, the majority of dogs that end up running into behavioral issues are of that maturing age, right? They're of that adolescent age where hormones are firing and they're distracted and they're, you know, starting to be ridiculous and pushy. And, you know, when you alter your dog at that point you're, or, or prior to it, you're really helping to take the edge off. Um, you're really helping your dog to become more focused. Uh, and to not represent a potential threat socially. So a lot of times in our socials, we talk with, with folks in our community classes, for example, about your unaltered dog may not have an aggressive bone in its body, but that doesn't mean that when you walk it into a park scenario or a social situation, that it isn't, uh, you know, representing uh, an energy, an essence, literally, of, you know, of trouble to the dogs that it's socializing with. So there are certain responsibilities that you have to take um, ownership of, of an intact dog, whether male or female. And I think that when you take that out of the equation, you're sort of taking the edge off. You're giving your dog a better opportunity to maybe think a little bit more clearly um, or to not have certain social stigmas against it. But I absolutely agree with you in terms of uh, there are literal studies shown that intact or not is not a, a representative of increased aggression. There's so much more to it than that. Um, and that, you know, the, the most significant argument is really the health factor. If we wait a bit to spay or neuter our dogs, we do know that we've seen a reduction in cancers in females. Males, supposedly, no change if you do it early or late. Um, and, and that, you know... Or be careful that the immune system is strong enough that your dog hasn't been bombarded with a bunch of vaccines and then a surgery. These things are hard on the body. So best case scenario, you do wait until that dog matures on some level and has had a chance to recover and bounce back from those hits. But behaviorally speaking, nice. um, I, for me, I just tell my clients, it takes the edge off. Like, why wouldn't you help a dog out 
if they're yeah. struggling with things like arousal <laughs> um, and they're, they're really distracted and they're overly bruxating and scenting and, and not connected with you because of those hormones that are in place, um, it, it's at least going to maybe give you a little bit of added advantage in addition to training and relationship stuff. Nice. Bruxating. <laughs> I don't want to demonstrate it because chances are you're going to figure out a way to like freeze frame or do like a boomerang <laughs> shot and that's going to go viral. No, so I, I am no. not going to give you a video no. demo right now. <laughs> I was just telling, I mean, I told people the other day, I said, I, I just think Cam's going to make me smarter because you use words that I, You're you welcome. know, I've heard. I just don't know how to use them in a sentence. All right, Gina, what, what do you, or Derek, Gina or Derek, do you have a thought on the, uh, the issue of neutering? Uh, um, in regard I like to say that the only thing that two dog trainers will ever agree on is that the third one is wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean. He's Switzerland. <laughs> no, I, I think I think there stand it, for it, something, Derek. Stand. No, for it, something. it's good to neuter. Um, I don't think I'd do it just because it would make the behaviors a little bit easier. And um, if there's a risk of you know neutering because, or if I want to neuter because the dog's got an active life and I want to just make sure I don't come home with puppies a few months later, then yeah, no, I totally would do that. And if there was some sort of like um, adoption issue, you know, if I want to get a dog from a kennel from a rescue, yeah, that's not a problem. But to just, you know, snip, snip because he's making me upset. That's the only reason why I won't neuter. Yeah. It's nice. not going to answer that issue, is it? Yep. Yeah. Well, here's a, a response. I guess it was Sherry. I mean, you didn't have to. I, uh, so Sherry Rennie, um, my curiosity with whether they were neutered was based on a possible theory that it may have increased the chance they were uh, fighting with each other over something and she tried to break them up. And they'd re redirect it on her. And yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, but dogs will fight whether they're neutered or not. And so I, I understand. I understand the question. And I understand that neutering uh, is, is one of those things. We, it, I, I would like to know, too, because then that adds to either what we just said or, you know, confirms what we just said that it didn't matter. Uh, and so I, it, it is good information. So I wasn't saying anything about the question being out of line at all, because it is interesting to, to know, uh, you know, all the details. Were they neutered? What's the prior training? Was there any protection training involved? And we just want to know all those things so we can kind of add it to uh, our base knowledge of things that are going on with dogs. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Sherry. I really appreciate it. Um, okay. So the other thing, and this is one of the things that Gina talked about, and that is the pounds per square inch in regard to the bites and, uh, and some things that were said about which dogs bites are harder and that kind of stuff. And uh, I, I, I know that at least the dogs we're talking about, German Shepherds, Belgian Malinois, Rottweilers, um, Pit Bulls, and the other dog that you brought up. I already forgot the name of that breed. Uh, but um, they're, 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 it's strong, <laughs> and it hurts. Uh, and there are some dogs that are more readily to let go after they bite uh, in, and some that aren't. And so um, I think a lot of damage is caused in trying to get the dog off. Now, I, my, personal, my police dog bit 78 people on the street. Uh, and I sent him to bite the people and I wanted him to bite them. Uh, but the damage that was caused was based on how hard the person fought and tried to get the dog off. That's where the damage was caused. The bite itself generally was a, a bite of uh, four punctures on the top and the bottom. And as long as the person didn't fight too much, we were able to get the dog off and it wasn't damaged. The damage comes in uh, the dog not letting go and the, the attempt to get the dog off. So you got to be very careful when I'm training a, a police dog or, um, a protection dog, or even, even an aggressive dog, I always give instruction. I say, if your dog bites me, uh, please do not panic and try to rip the dog off my arm or my leg or my butt, uh, which is the case I got bitten in Huntington Beach by a pit bull on the butt. Um, and just, uh, I will talk you through it. I know it's going to hurt, uh, <laughs> but I don't, want you to, I don't want you to panic uh, because you're going to cause more damage on me when I'm getting bit than uh, by, by panicking than you will if I give you direction how to get the dog off. So, um, that that's one of the things that you got to be aware of that the pounds per square inch there there you know i thought gina brought up some good points and what were the what were the dogs that you talked about gina uh in um, regard to that well the shepherds King, right yeah well the rottweilers and the and the uh shepherds were stronger psi than a pit bull and then the kangal had had a what 735 um, psi wow the the so kangal was that what you said Turkish kangal. yeah oh, okay I'm not sure that I've ever come those across for those. perimeter guarding here. There you go. <laughs> First time I've ever heard. Can you train me up a Turkish Kangol, guys? 
<laughs> I think I think Jeff has one of those, doesn't he? Yeah, he recommended. He recommended it because we have ten acres here. Yeah. Um, so a great opportunity for a dog to have a, a really good job to do in terms of perimeter guarding and livestock guarding. And uh, yeah, but I wouldn't even know where to begin sourcing a good dog uh, for, for that purpose. So I'm going to count on you guys to hook, hook me up. <laughs> oh, All right. Very cool. All right. So let's get into the training. I'm going to uh, I'm going to make my screen uh, solo. You guys are still going to be on so you can comment anytime you want. But I'm just going to kind of kind of frame what it is that I'm talking about. And then I'll bring you guys back on to kind of, you know, chime in on to different aspects of whatever it is you want to talk about. So um, over the last couple of days, I've been training uh, two dogs. One of them is a bed bug dog and one of them is an explosive detection dog. And I'm constantly reminded uh, of how people can increase the either the anxiety or the energy of the dog just based on how they're handling the situation. And um, if they're trying to get the, say a dog has a, a ball in his mouth, in the case of the bomb, uh, explosive detection dog, that this dog is very desirous of the ball, wants to bite it, wants to, you know, if you try to get it out of its mouth, he wants to pull back and fight. There's a string on the ball. And uh, the, the, the trick of getting to a point of where you can train the dog to release on command is not in all the activity of trying to get a hold of the dog, wrestle the dog to the ground, trying to get your hands on the ball. The more all of that happens, the uh, it increases the desire of the dogs to to keep the ball, right? And it actually enhances the dog's uh, you know play instinct or prey instinct or whatever it is you want to, or even the fight. There, there could be aspect of the, the dog desiring to, to fight even more with you. And it really causes you more grief. So if we change that over into obedience and we really want to start to get obedience out of our dog, quite often uh, in our group training obedience, that very first day when we bring about, you know, 10 to 13 people together on a field <clears throat> with all their dogs, there's quite often a lot of anxiety, not only in the dogs, but in the human beings, because now they're coming into a group environment. They don't want to stand out as being the bad dog parent and they don't want their dog to embarrass them. And so you have this energy of tenseness and and kind of uh, anticipating their dog embarrassing them. And so the very first exercise we do in training our, 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 our students is that <clears throat> we want them to stand still and we simply want to get their dogs into a sit and we don't want them to do anything else. And I, and I, and I started this back whenever it was I started. It was a long time ago. And, uh, and because I felt that it was really necessary to bring both parties, the dog and the human being, into a place of calm so we can begin to the, the process of teaching them where to go from the place of calm. Uh, because so much of when people come to us uh, is because their dogs have uh, either knocked them over, knocked somebody else over, bit somebody, or drugged them down the street because they were chasing after a skateboarder, that they're there and they're, they're very uh, emotional, they're very nervous, and so they wanna quickly try to do something and you see people getting very handsy with their dogs trying to move their dog around and trying to force that dog into a sit position. And it becomes a little bit of a wrestling match and then things go completely uh, out of control. And so our encouragement is to, to get people in a place of calm. And if we need to, we separate them from the rest of the group because uh, it's sometimes just being in that environment can be too stressful if they have a dog on either side of them and their dogs are growling or barking. And so I always wanna remind people that you need to come to this place of calm, go to a place where you can relax and not uh, be distracted by a bunch of people walking around. If your dog has dog aggression, the last place you want to train necessarily may not be uh, near a dog park or near Petco or PetSmart or at a very busy park. And so finding that place of calm is the place where you need to start. Now, to get past the aggression of other dogs, you need to work up to where now you're doing obedience in, in front of dogs. But if you find yourself wrestling with your dog to try to get something out of its mouth, if you find yourself trying to wrestle the dog just to simply get into the sit, you're going to have a very tough time of, of getting to a place to start uh, with your dog in, in re regard to obedience. And so um, what I wanted to talk about um, uh, with, uh, let's talk with Gina and Derek first. What are some of the things that you do to get people to relax? If, if, I don't even know if you agree with me, but uh, I'm assuming you do because we all work together on the same program. But <laughs> what are some of the things you think are important about how to get people in a place of calm to start working with their dogs? Do you have any ideas on, uh, that you can throw out there? You're right. Go ahead. Ladies You're first. Up. No, you go ahead. I've been on, I've been on the show. No, li literally, <laughs> literally, I just, I look at people once the situation is safe, of course, I, I just look at them. I have them make eye contact with me and I just, I make that physical, you know, releasing breath movement with them. And then they kind of get the picture like, oh, maybe I should relax too. 
But it just you got to look at them. You got to kind of empathize with them, and then give them techniques and reasonable things to do to move forward positively from that point. In my opinion, at least. Let me just let me just add to this with Derek because uh, uh, Derek has been around for a really long time. He started with me back when he was uh, like, uh, you know, what were you, sixteen, seventeen? I forget when you started, but it was quite a long time ago. Uh, I, but. I, I, um, People the story that when uh, I was of age, you just told me, hey, come on Tuesday, stop bugging me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but the one thing I like about Derek is that he has the same way of handling many situations, and that is with a sense of humor. And I think that's kind of our strength is that we, we tend to try to get people to smile through some type of, uh, you know, uh, some story or by joking around with them because we need to break that tension. Again, most people that are seeing us and they're, they're in that group environment are there because it's something happened that if I don't get this dog fixed, you know, bad things are going to happen. And so I, I think at least for, and then Gene is pretty funny too, but as far as uh, Derek is concerned, uh, I think that using her humor as a dog trainer or thinking about something a little bit more relaxing prior to getting started is really important thing that to take your, your, uh, to mind, to something that's not so stressful and sometimes just telling a joke or just thinking about something funny is the, is, is the right place to go. Uh, Gina, what do you think? What's, uh, what's one of the things you do to get people calmed down? <laughs> uh, well, we all have taught the same classes, so pretty much the same thing. I've also, um, when we start moving, I tell people to kind of just like put their hands in their pocket. Like when you take a stroll down the beach, what do you do? You put your hands in your pocket and you kind of just relax and that's like a relaxing walk or, or something that, you know, that people just do naturally to just enjoy, you know, the ambiance of the waves or whatever is around. So I just say, just put your hands in your pocket and walk like you're walking on the beach and enjoying the sunset. And, and it's, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's a good point because I, I find people, and this goes back to Cher. She's the bomb dog handler. Uh, is that when she gets tense, she walks like a robot. And I is, and I tell her, I said, Cher, is that how you is that how you normally walk? Knowing that she doesn't, and she says, walk like what? And she's like, I, and she's acting very stiff. I said that that alone is tension. The way that you're walking is causing the dog to think, what the hell's wrong with her, and why is she walking this way? And really important that you act, you walk and act as if you didn't have the dog there. That's really important, I think, is to, to teach people how to walk naturally because your dog is watching you, right? They know when you're prepared to, to give them a rip and a correction. They, they're, they know when you're getting ready to, to discipline in some, in, some, uh, in, in some way or another. And so you need to show them the body language of, of normality so that they never know when it's coming, right? If they have to correct you or when the praise is coming. Right. You can you can you can um, flag that you're about ready to praise them and they get excited and jump on you in anticipation that you're given ready to give them a toy or a, or a treat or something like that. So that that what you're talking about is just, hey, relax, you know, relax your arms, maybe put them in the pocket. Maybe uh, you're, you know, change the way you're walking to something that's a little bit more natural because that uh, causes that tension that uh, we're talking about. Uh, Cam, do you uh, have any thoughts on uh, on this place of calm? How do you get people there to, to start your training process? Um, I think the strategies are really similar, actually, but I also definitely share very authentically a scenario in which I, too, have failed or made a fool of myself. Um, it's extremely disarming to talk to someone and say, I know exactly what you're going through. I remember when I did that, too. Or, um, you know, when I first started really being conscientious about these details, this was the experience for me as well. And you know, as soon as you, you start to share authentically that you too have struggled, it really, really, really can disarm your clients significantly. And the other thing I use is I say to my clients oftentimes that I want them to bring their executive self. Um, so many people are feeling really like subordinate as a client coming into a training scenario where they're waiting for information they didn't have before. They're waiting to understand how they failed and how they can fix it. Um, and really, as a trainer, what we need them to do is we need them to bring their most confident negative self in order to take the literal details of the mechanics and dynamics that we're sharing with them and deliver them in a way that their dog is going to hear, receive, respect, um, and respond to. So I always tell my clients, like, what do you do that makes you feel super kick-ass? Like, what is your thing in your life that makes you feel strong and competent? 
Um, I'll often ask them questions about what they do for a living. And I have these executives. I have people who lead teams. I have people who, you know, are great and strong in a certain area of their life and that get really lit up and become essentially calmer and more relaxed when they're in that confident space. That's when I'll begin the lesson. I want them in that zone mentally and emotionally before I start giving them new things to work on and try um, and so much information to absorb and try to sort out. So um, it's kind of a combination of exactly what you guys are talking about and then also like really being willing to share the ugly business of where I've struggled through something as well that's going to feel relatable and kind of relax them by way of finding equality. So I'm no longer really the teacher. I'm just a friend. And we're just talking through a strategy that I have insight on. And they're, they're totally capable of hearing it at that point and moving forward. Nice. Okay, one of the other places that I see this, uh, this, this stress come through the, the leash uh, or comes through the training is through the leash. And that is, the by the way, of people wrapping that leash around their hands or they have all these knots that they put in the leash so that they can get a grip. Uh, but what I have found is that by doing that is that, again, you're signaling down to the dog that you're not calm, that you're just so concerned about what they're getting ready to do that it now sets the dog up for failure because he thinks you're so stressed out about what's in front of him, not that you're stressed out about what he's going to do. And so that sends a signal to the dog that, oh, I can see that they're tightening on the leash and they're pulling back on the leash. And now the dog's going, why are they say ner- why are they say nervous, so nervous? And now they begin lashing out because they believe that the handler's uh, concerned about what's in front of them, not what's next to them. And so that one of the things I do is I get people, you got you to gotta put some slack in that line. Let's get that thing ra- unwrapped out of your hand. I show them how they can hold on to it almost more powerfully with their thumb through the loop and then holding on to it in, in a fashion that's not this wrapping, right, <laughs> around their bodies and around their ways. I'm going to hold on to this dog. That, that shows them, the dog, that you're calm because now you have the slack line. And just simply having a slack line can change everything. And yeah. uh, what have you noticed some of that stuff? Uh, One of my about? favorite oh, phrases yeah. I have to share is what we brace for, we create. So as oh. soon as I see somebody doing something like that, they don't mean to, they don't want to, but it's exactly as you said, uh, it's pretty predictably going to create the exact opposite behavior that they want. So I regularly coach my clients, what you brace for, you create. If you're bracing for the reactivity, if you're bracing for the nonsense behavior from your dog, you're going to actually more likely perpetuate that showing up, you know, in these situations. You've got to distance yourself. You've got to buy yourself some seconds to give your dog a lesson and allow your dog to make a, a make a mistake away from you. And that not having that leash wound up around your wrist and so tight is going to, going to allow you to have that conversation. So no bracing. What we brace for, we create. Wow. I wish I would have said that. <laughs> but- <laughs> <laughs> Gina, you look like you were going to, you were going to comment on this. Either. It's fine. No, I was going to say is, is, um, you know, we get a lot of, uh, dogs that have been rejected or kicked out of other academies or, you know, store training, as you can see. <laughs> oh, are we allowed to say pet smart? Nope. Can- no, we can't. Nope. <laughs> No, we're not. Um, so, you know, just the fact that the humiliation of them, you know, getting kicked out of another class and coming to another, a whole new class and, you know, you got 10 other people and, you know, they come in really nervous and um, apprehensive of what to expect. And, and um, you know, so it's really, uh, those are the people that we really try and, you know, decompress and, and just say, don't worry, everybody here. All these other nine people here are here for the same reason, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the th- one of the things that um, oh, uh, Derek, did you have anything to say about that? Sorry, didn't mean to. Uh, G- Gina wraps it up in a bow. That's why I love working with her. All right, cool. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I try to do to show them is I don't do it very often, but if I if I think this is going to make it a significant point, is I take the dog from them and show them the difference between how their dog reacts when they're with me as a dog reacts with them. Uh, and it's, it's almost magical. And I wait for the right, I at least try to wait for the right moment to make the biggest impact because I can see that the, the most, the, uh, the, the biggest reason the dog is acting out is because of whatever it is they're doing. It could be the way that they're, they're, they're pushing the dog around and shoving him with their knees. It could be the way they had the leash wrapped up in their hand. And if I've talked to them three or four times to stop doing that and they don't, then at the point that I think they're going to pay the most, the, the moment that they're the most frustrated, when their hair is in front of their face, when they're sweating, 
uh, when they're, uh, you know, just getting ready to give up is when I'll take the dog and then show them that here we go. This is what it looks like. I'm going to give you a loose leash. I'm going to go do some obedience. I'm going to make their dog do things that they never thought their dog could do in just a matter of minutes. And it's not because I'm special. It's just really because, uh, you know, like, like all of you, you've been doing it for a really, really long time. And we know we're not, we're not intimidated by dogs. We're not, uh, you know, we're not usually afraid about getting bit because most of us have been bit at some point or another. Uh, and so that doesn't come into play. And so because we're a little bit more calm and more confident in what we're doing, the dogs instantly have a, a, a change of behavior. Um, so it's one of my favorite things to do because I, I just see it in the face. I go, oh, how did you, what? That, he's never done that before. <laughs> but it just really comes because of the, of the, the energy that we put off in the, the body language what they're showing. Uh, do you ever use that technique, uh, Derek? Well, I, I, I'll tell you right now, um, I still get customers that say, oh my gosh, Andy took my dog one time and then he totally tranquilized the dog or something. I, I do whatever. <laughs> Uh, Cam, Cam, I saw you shaking your head. I am so into my dog nerd cult, it's not even funny. Uh, so I take the dogs all the time and create the magical moment. But the way that I look at that, again, to like put it into Cam terms, is see one, do one, teach one. So I really like to demonstrate it so that my client is seeing it. Now they do it, and then you I want them to on go. on your um, whiteboard? No, we, we need to get this on a calendar. Can you like put these on your whiteboard? That's what that yeah, white yeah. one is for. Take, I can't, yeah, there you go. Come Take on. Notes. This is a writer downer, Andy. Yeah, say that, that, say that again. See one. See one, do one, teach one. See one, do one, teach one. So a really good example of that is all of my graduated clients, generally we're a board and train company more than anything else. We don't do a lot of classes or one-on-ones. We do almost none. Our classes are free. So at our free community class, our established clients, our graduate clients come into the, the program to proof their dogs, to practice um, and continue to enhance the dog's behavior. And then their job, their expectation, and it's clearly articulated to them and they're super passionate about it, is to pay it forward by helping the people who are attending the class that have never worked with us before. So those might be foster families that have a dog from another rescue. They might be locals who are struggling to get solutions and they're at risk of losing their housing. Um, we provide that free community class every month to get information out there to people who really need it, to keep dogs in their homes. That's part of our rescue work because we want to see less dogs coming into our rescue. And so our established clients are a really integral part of the process. <laughs> uh -huh. In that class, I got Kai coming in and going, um, in that class where they're meant to pay it forward and to share the information, their success stories, to communicate how the value of the training they've been through and of staying the course and doing the work at home. So if you've got somebody who saw me handle their dog first day, you know, take the leash and create magic, and then they go through the work doing it themselves, and now they teach it to someone else, it's really locked and loaded in there, and I don't have to do a whole lot of support after that. It's pretty darn cool. Pretty darn cool. Nice. Good deal. All right. Um, I look at my agenda, the leash, the taking your dog like from them. I seven guard dogs around me right now. It's hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> One little sliding door and the whole, the whole house went up. <laughs> So to, uh, to, to wrap this thing up a little bit, is there anything that I missed in this? And I know that seems like a very odd topic. And I, when I wrote it, it, it's just I spent the last two days talking about it so much. I thought somehow we have to kind of bring this out that you have to, you have to find this place of, of calm when you begin, you know, you know if you're training your own dog. Quick question but, for you, because um, yep. I didn't catch the total top of the broadcast. And this was super last minute spur of the moment to join on. Um, yep. And I might also be going super off on a tangent, but when I think about calm, I think about the dog from the inside out. So I'm curious if you talked at all about like the health nutrition aspect of things no. and the fact that so much of our dogs that are coming into training, and I know you've encountered this, are anxious, they're wound up, they're adrenalized, they're um, aroused because they're feeling like crap, right? And a lot of these dogs are not eating a biologically appropriate diet. A lot of them are not experiencing enough calmness from the internal space in the gut, et cetera. Um, some of them are on literal, you know, foods that are increasing behavioral issues. So for me, the conversation of starting from a place of calm absolutely has to include the nutritional piece. It has to include talking about 
whether or not your dog is actually healthy and getting the stuff that it needs to systemically relax, right? Um, so I talk a lot about that with my clients too, and I'd really encourage your listeners to be thinking about that um, as, as they approach like an overhaul with their dog that a lot of stuff has changed by a, an approach on behavior, but there's a very significant piece too that we can't not acknowledge that has to do with if your dog doesn't feel well, they're not going to perform well. So really taking a look at educating yourself around nutrition and biologically appropriate feeding and whether or not your dog at their age or their, um, you know, their energy output and so forth are getting what they need to feel satisfied and calm naturally. Because that definitely is something that we run into as being a factor here for us with our clients too. Good point. Gina, Derek? No, no, very good point. I I didn't even think about that. My gosh, I actually should have thought about that. Well we, well, we do have a program called Feeding Your Dog Raw and Natural, which I'm going to put in the comment section. <laughs> You're welcome. Just click, just click on that link, and I, and I have a series of videos where I teach you how to feed your dog raw and natural, which is a great way of getting the nutrition that your dog needs. Yeah, uh, and we'll also, talk about uh, that a lot. But, um, good stuff. Um, Finding a, a, a good natural uh, dog food that has human grade ingredients, uh, making sure that you don't go cheap on your dog food. Uh, I know that it's at times I'll mention science diet and that kind of stuff. I, I'm just not a huge fan, and that's just who I am. Uh, but but I, I, I like the open farm dog food. I have like blue buffalo for many years, but there's been some talk lately about it. But um, you're going to have to decide for yourself uh, in some of the other dog foods. I think uh, you just got to do your research. If you go to a good natural food, uh, dog food place, I'm, I'm sure you'll find some really good food. But you want to make sure that it's human grade ingredients and they have the proteins and the ingredients uh, and stay away from the grains that your, uh, your dog could actually use. So that's really important. And good proper exercise uh, for your dog is super important. Um, and yeah, that's it. So I just wanted to know if there's anything that I missed that, that, that was a great point. And that's why Cam, you're my co-host on my show and Derek, not, no, just kidding. Just kidding. He just uh, likes anything to make problems for himself. <laughs> yeah, he does. You feel only a beer. <laughs> I know. I know. You think that's uh, you think this is a uh, uh, coffee in this cup? <laughs> hey, so Cam, I, Cam, I got a question for you. Um, in, in regards to when you talk to um, your clients about um, healing from the inside out and starting with nutrition, what is the percentage of your clients that actually do? Because a lot of it comes down to budget, right? So a lot of people say, I, I, you know, I don't have the money to change, you know, from pedigree to raw and do all that stuff. So how do you, because that's what I kind of run into too, because I, I kind of do a, a pseudo, you know, raw diet for my dogs, um, but not everybody can afford that. So how, what do you, how, what do you do in that case? How do you convince them? How do you, well, do you convince them or do you just take a different route? Yeah, great question. I never try to convince anyone of anything. So for starters, convince is not in my vocabulary. Enroll may be in my vocabulary. Um, and I do certainly try to enroll people in an understanding that they need to just get creative potentially, um, or that if they truly do have a limitation financially, that at least they can do research on the commercial pet food industry and understand how to supplement pet food, um, kibble based diets in order to make them more complete and more balanced for their dog. So in a conversation about what I think needs to happen with a particular dog, I'm definitely going to prescribe and recommend what I believe in, which is fresh or raw feeding. There are multiple ways to go after that, and some of them don't have to be that cost prohibitive. They may take a little bit more work or planning, but um, it's actually less expensive when we talk about it from the um, end of the veterinary care and the loss of life and quality of life, right, and work our way backwards. So... I talk about it in relationship to human, you know, nutrition. We know we feel better. We perform better. We live longer. Make it stop. Who's that? Andy. Play Mandy.
Hey. Da Hey. Yes. Mo it was Andy. It okay. was Andy. Andy. That's okay. We don't need Andy. Um, <laughs> so, as I was saying, um, I will talk with them more about why this is Oh, Andy, get, get off. off. Get off, Get Andy. off, Andy. Get off. Andy. Get get off. off. Get off. conversation, Andy. Get off. Get another microphone. Get off. Totally on his end. Get off, Andy. That is great. Nobody can hear you. Now we really want to know what's in that mouth. I know. I got nothing. I cannot hear anything. Yay! Thank you. Cameron, as you were saying. As I was saying. Um, so I think one of the key components is just to really sell them on process, right? And if you really help them to understand why they would assume, why they would apply the same concepts to themselves and how they feed their kids or, you know, a, an overhaul they've needed to make in their general health, they're going to be able to work harder and be, become more tenacious about solving this issue for their dog, right? So I, I definitely approach it from that standpoint. But if it truly is about, um, you know, uh, they have five dogs, for example, and, and God bless, that's expensive. Then I will talk with them about the fact that there's still information that they can uh -oh. gleam uh, to understand kibble and, and healthier, you know, USA made, purer protein, higher protein, right? and the things they can be adding to their kibble to complete that diet where it um, goes rancid too fast and you know buying huge quantities is not usually an advantage and adding fresh fruits and vegetables. We now know that doing that like three times a week decreases cancer by something like 80%. It's ridiculous. So I will talk with them about you know the fact that they have a couple of options. I'll prescribe very confidently your dog should be on a raw diet it's not satisfied or it is not getting the nutritional value that it needs in order to eliminate the allergy issues and some of these other things. Um, but then I'll let them know, like, look, once you get into it and we have files for this in our closed group client page, so we make it really accessible to them to get coaching, continue coaching. Once we get through that, um, I'll let them know the alternative is educating yourself better about, <laughs> I have a little dog here who wants to die, um, educating <laughs> yourself a little bit better about, you know, kibble and, and where you can improve a kibble based diet if you have to. So I honestly nice don't job. get a lot of pushback, Gina. It's a great question, but yeah. um, I'm amazed at how many people are ready to do what's best for their dog. So yeah. many of our clients are so eager to understand what it is that they're missing about the pet food industry, why their dog's coats are dull or is excessively shedding, why their dogs have gas and, you know, itchiness and all these different things, right? Um, and once you tell them that's not normal, that it doesn't have to be that way, that it's like just something that everyone's accepted as part of a bulldog breed or whatever, you know, the things are that we tell ourselves, that it's actually sickness and that it's disease processes that are going to take our dogs from us earlier and reduce our quality of life. People are really eager to figure out how to make it happen. I'm amazed. So we do try to just really hold their hand on a deeper level when it when they show us that they're interested. Um, and if cost is an issue, to me, that's just a lack of information. They're just not thinking creatively enough. That's all. And they, they think that raw diet is really complicated when, in fact, it can be very simple and have a lot of variety and, you know, be more affordable even than kibble. When you think about pest prevention, like parasite prevention, things like that that can be incorporated into a raw food diet uh, versus a kibble diet. So I, I just I just really wish, Cam, that you had an opinion on on nutrition. <laughs> hey, hey, Andy, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for I'm being a co-host. Nice my... to clear your static air. This, this is why I have Karen as my co-host and not you. Programming professionalism a little bit here. <laughs> Technology. We need to bring that, you know, executive I'm... self. Uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> All right, so we have a question here from uh, Kim uh, Hollinger, who has uh, 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 Lola. That's the dog we trained for peanut detection uh, that we are good, had the good grace to be on uh, National Geographic with. But she says, "How do uh, how do handle the <laughs> how do you handle this with PTSD clients? Uh, the bond between Lola and Kindle just made Lola instinctually 
um, pick up on it and distract Kendall. Distract Kendall. I'm curious on how this happens on a training perspective. Hmm. Ooh, Let me read that question. again. Yeah. Go ahead, Cam. Cam, the only one that understands yeah, I don't, it. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, those are all big words. Um. Well, the way, the way that I heard that question anyway was that she's assuming that the dog instinctually connected the dots more so than it was any training that was involved as far as a relationship bond. And I could be wrong, but that's how I heard it. And yeah. so I think what she's asking for is how do you actually train that if it's possible and cultivate that level of connection? Or is it truly more an instinct thing? Isn't that what I, isn't that what's going on here? I That's think, what I yeah, You're I think better. so. I mean, there's, there's the bond of the dogs that, uh, you know, they become connected uh, to the emotions, oh. the, uh, the, 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 if they don't feel well, uh, if they're stressed out and dogs, you know, quickly, uh, you know, read your energy, uh, smell the change in your, uh, you know, what's being put out by your pores uh, and how you smell when you're scared and how you smell when you're relaxed and not scared. Uh, yeah. And so all those things work together very, very fast. It's not something that's a slow process. Dogs just know, right? They can look at somebody and hate them uh, just at the moment they meet them because of all those things happening all at once. So uh, when a dog gets really close to their handler and a Kindle, uh, that if you don't know, she had, um, she has a, an extreme uh, uh, a case of uh, food allergies that when smelling the wrong, even smelling the wrong things, she could have, she can be put in the emergency room uh, wow. and need her EpiPen. So, um, uh, you know, the dog became very protective uh, of her in a lot of different ways. Uh, but yeah, I think that what you're reading is that I'm not, I think that that's just the relationship between the dog and the handler in a lot of ways. I, I think obedience in that case is super important. Uh, it's, it's like a dog that, uh, that's aggressive or, or fear, or fear aggressive that that's where obedience becomes more important. And, and what happens with, what was that a beer can the popping? Um, that when, a, when, a, when a dog is, uh, overreactive because of how, you know, their, their handler is uh, being coming fearful, the obedience becomes way more important. Uh, and, and sometimes we end up coddling dogs that are showing fear or concern about us as opposed to uh, having the dog go into obedience mode. What's happening in the background there that I don't know? There's a fire being made. It's so cozy. You want to see it? <laughs> yeah. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I thought the question was really cool because, um, because I think a lot of people are asking this when they want their dog to turn into a service dog. Right? They mm -hmm. just like generally yep. want yep. their dog to become their service dog. But there, these are the factors. The factors are, is the dog well suited to it genetically? Does the dog naturally lean into the role and, and fulfill that um, relationship connection naturally? And then can we enhance it and draw it out with training? Right? I mean, to me, that yes. was like a really cool question to come up because um, at least for me, I run into to clients all the time who want to cultivate a service dog out of a not service dog like the dog is not <laughs> gonna make a good service dog um and they're yes. trying to create this you know dynamic and relationship outcome and there is a genetic component that is just purely missing or there is an a, a conditioning component that is totally missing and we can't go back and get that time that wasn't um consciously uh, utilized. So I just thought it was a really cool question because to me it stood out as sort of, you know, one of those dynamics that we see a lot lately where people want to know why can't my dog become my PTSD dog or my, you know, emotional support animal or, you know, whatever it is that the, the really unique work that you guys are doing with some of these dogs doing bed bug detection and things like this. Like, you know, why can't every dog do that? Because not all of them have what it takes inherently. So it is a very much a combination of those things. I think people that's need to the, the, select, the selection of the dog is so important. And I, I, I know that that's where we are so different than everybody else. That sometimes they just find a dog and begin training it to do uh, A, B, or C. Uh, uh, my job, I feel, is to find the right dog for the job and the right dog for the person. And if, if, if I don't see that there's going to be a connection or there's no connection, then I know right away we're going to have a problem. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have a bomb dog, narcotics dog, peanut detection dog, service dog. You have to have the right dog for the right job connected with the right person or else it's not going to work. Um, now, I, I have seen forced relationships with Belgian Malinois and German Shepherds. And then at some point, something goes wrong. Either the dog bites the handler or the dog bites a member of the family that they live with. And so... Um, uh, you, you, there's, 
I mean, they may work, right? Because a dog can work out of fear. I, and I've seen that with a lot of police dogs when I was being raised as a police dog handler. Most of our training involved fear. The dog thought, if I don't do this, I'm going to die. And that's how our training was. We used cattle prods and sticks and sharpened pinch collars. And it was, uh, it was a very rough, rough time for me because I wasn't really in agreement with what it is we were doing to dogs. But I know the dogs worked, right? The dogs did it. But it wasn't because they wanted to. It was because they, they were afraid that they might die. Uh, and then we would have dogs biting their handlers all the time or biting some a member of the family. So, um, yeah, we're making that connection uh, with the, uh, the dog that's going to be used for PSD or PTSD or um, peanut detection. It, it's important to have the right dog. The only thing about uh, uh, Kim and Kendall's dog is that there's, there's some other issues that I found were not that great, but they, they wanted it to work and we, we did make it work. But um, uh, and, and Kim knows what those are <laughs> and, uh, and they've learned to live with those, those issues. And that's, that's fine. The dog works and does well for them, but uh, they still have to manage those issues. General public to hear, you know, um, yeah. that, that they've made some concessions and they've made some um, exceptions to, to what they expect of that relationship and dynamic on the basis of what matters most to them. Not that it's a hundred percent perfect scenario set up because they had a, the, the dog and handler had a close relationship and then you're just able to cultivate service work out of that and it's hunky-dory from then on. I think that's super important for people to hear the, re, the truth of what, yep. you know, what you had to come to terms with and accept and adjust. Yes. All right, anything else? We had uh, Kim agreed, it was, was said, Cam, you are 100% correct, yes. Uh, that's what she was saying. And uh, I'm glad you understood that. <laughs> I got you. I got you, friend. I got you. <laughs> uh, Kim and Kendall. Kim and Kendall and I. Anytime. <laughs> Kim and Kim and Kendall and I spent uh, many days together try, during a really rough time at Falco Canine Academy, and I I love them both. Uh, uh, Kendall has become a fantastic singer, artist, uh, songwriter, and as a uh, as a new record deal that she's been uh, traveling around and, and singing oh. at churches and singing and. In, in cafe, she was a professional, or going to uh, not a professional, a, 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 a you know a, a figure skater. I'm not sure if you ever she ever went professional, uh, but she she was really high, you know, expected to do well in like very many competitions. Uh, but they're great people. We spent uh, several days on a on a TV set doing shooting the National Geographic show. So um, I, I really I love I love both of them very much. Let's see. Mark Weisenberger says, hello, Andy. Didn't say hello to either one of you guys or any of you. So don't <laughs> worry about that. <laughs> and uh, Sherry felt sorry for me. So Sherry says, poor Andy, because I was having trouble with, with whatever was going on here. The, the, the internet gods. You're causing problems. No don't poor try Andy. to spin it. No poor Andy. No poor Andy. The Cameron the internet and Gary show. What kind of show is he running here? I'm no, it's <laughs> our show. We have commandeered you know, it. I can, I, can kick, I can kick you off anytime I want. <laughs> Goodbye. Come Goodbye. Home, home to canine page. I got you. <laughs> I, just, I just kicked them off the show. You're so mean. All right. You know, we... Great time. That was to, so mean. That was so mean. We, we used to have viewers. Now we have nobody watching anymore. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's go back to the topic, which we are kind of we kind of left the talk the topic there a little bit. Is there anything that we missed in regard to helping people understand that 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 calm to be uh, it to, needs to be the, the the beginning stage of training with your dog? If you if you're going to start this training with your dog, that find the calm, take the dog to a place where you can start. If you have aggression with dogs, you know, start away from dogs. If you have aggression with other people, start away from people. Distance is, uh, is your friend away from whatever distraction it is that your dog's distracted by. So increase distance and then find that place to calm and then work towards the things that will cause stress and anxiety and barking and growling and all that kind of stuff. Is there anything we missed to help people uh, understand that aspect? I don't want to add anything or it's going to turn into a 17-hour show. I don't mind. I don't mind. That's what I was thinking. That's what I'm I was thinking. I'm going to say nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> That's everything. Covered it all. It's all a wrap. Right. <laughs> so wait, Kim, Kim had one thing to say, and this is about what I was talking about, that she does have her issues. But Kim says, uh, we just accept she's not perfect, but she's perfect for us. And that is fantastic. And uh, I have to tell you, they have some great and success stories. Oh, but uh, I, I got to tell you, I love the text messages I get from Kim. And they, she says, oh, my gosh, uh, Lola had another incident where she alerted uh, uh, Kendall to the presence of uh, peanuts. 
uh, in the environment. And the stories she has are amazing. If you, we should just have her on a show someday to share all the stories. Uh, nice. But there, there were times when they weren't, they were least expecting it. As a matter of fact, the last one I think was uh, Kendall's father. Um, and I forgot his name. I'm just, I'm just escaping his name. Uh, but he ended up having like peanuts on his elbow because he happened to put his elbow on something. And the dog kept going to him, and he's like, well, "Stay away from me! What are you doing?" And the dog eventually they, they determined that he had he had brought home some peanut butter on his elbow or something like that. I, I think I'm pretty close to the story, but it was it was amazing the story she told me that this is like. And then Kendall uh, actually started to show a little bit of like nauseousness, almost that she was beginning to have an attack. And then they were able to put the two together. And the whole time the dog was trying to tell him, "Hey, I tried to tell you, <laughs> he's got peanuts on him. You listen to me." So it was pretty good. Um, uh oh, we have another question here. Are you ready for another one? Before we leave, uh, what do you think about using uh, a basket muzzle as a tool to take away some of the anxiety from the owner if they feel confident their dog can't hurt any, can't hurt someone? Yes, well, I think it's a good idea. If the dog is muzzle conditioned, yeah. Uh, if the dog is not muzzle conditioned, you're going to add a whole other shit storm of struggle on top of everything else. Thank you, Cam. Thank you. Mike. I knew. I knew I liked you. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> Where's my mic? Oh, it's on your mic. You're doing it. You're killing it, man. You're killing it. Oh, yeah. You, uh, you, can, really, you can actually increase a anxiety and, uh, and stress yeah. from the dog by putting a muzzle on him. So be careful yeah. on how you're doing it. Um, what we do, and just kind of give you an example of one of the things that we do to introduce the dog to the muzzle, is that we make sure and have the dog's favorite treat on hand. If what I really like on a muzzle is uh, to take the um, pepperonis. I know that pepperonis are actually not that great of an ingredient, but the pepperonis fit through the little holes in the uh, muzzle, and you put that through the hole. And as the dog puts his face in the muzzle, uh, he can take little bites of that treat. I don't strap it on. You don't strap it on. Yes. Strap it on. Don't strap it on. Don't, don't strap it on. Don't put pepperonis in the hole. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I don't want to see any of you. I'm going, I'm, going, awful. I'm going solo. Don't strap it on. No. All right. I'm getting rid of all of you guys. All right. So you put the pup in the hole and the dog will stick his face in the muzzle. Do not strap the muzzle on. Let the dog to eat out of the muzzle to introduce the muzzle to the dog. And then as the dog begins to put his face voluntarily into the muzzle, then you can strap on the muzzle. And, uh, and slowly introduce the dog. That's one way of doing it, regardless of their laughter and they're making fun of whatever it is talking about. That is the way we did it for years and it went way better. And the dogs actually wanted to put on their muzzle and didn't pull away or try to shake it off because they knew that it was a great place to be because they got their favorite treat. And pepperonis were fantastic for training that. And I'm, I'm gonna refuse to bring them on. <laughs> I'm not bringing them back on. Yes, for sure, see? Sherry, I love you. How would you like to be the co-host of my show, uh, Train the Dog Trainer? <laughs> I, I can see your lips moving. <laughs> All right. But that is the way. You want to introduce the muzzle to the dog. Uh, Kim, I'm going to bring you guys back on. Just calm down. Kim uh, Hollinger says, we use a, a basket muzzle on Lola for situations where there's people in close contact with Kindle. Yes. But make sure. <laughs> At least Sherry's laughing. All right. I'll bring it back on cam and all right, you're back. Don't ever put baby in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I couldn't get to it. Oh. At least Sherry thought it was fun. We lost all of our viewers. Oh, That's God. just great. That's because you kicked us off. You can't put baby in the corner. That's right. That's well, right. just so you know, we have 133 people watching just so you know. You said we lost everybody. What is it? Those are our people. Gina and Derek and I drew them here just to love ourselves, just the three of us. While you were strapping on something. I'm afraid. And eating pepperoni. I'm afraid to ask if there's anything else. pepperoni. It was indecent. Oh my gosh. We're a family dog training company. And I, I'm going to get drugged down that I'm the guy who took this place down to a place that is unacceptable. <laughs> Your I don't only fault is about. extending the conversation too long. That's all. You, you know, one thing about Cam is he, he, he throws in all these big words, and then every so often a little bit of potty mouth comes in, a little bit of crap, a little bit of shit. <laughs> I'm comes very in. balanced. I'm very balanced. Oh. 
And I don't know what Derek's doing, but he keeps getting his face in the camera. And... <laughs> what? What are you saying? Is this, is this microphone working? In a place of calm. All He's right. Stay calm. Uh, maintain control. Well, thank you for making this very boring topic in the beginning to a very exciting topic. I, I, uh, I had no idea there was so much to talk about uh, from a place of calm. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. It was truly my pleasure. <laughs> All right. You can. Yeah, you too. You guys are awesome. You done for the day, right? Take or for the weekend, I should say. Taking a break for the holiday. Yeah, kind of, sort of. No days off for a good dog trainer. Oh, this is now you're just this isn't this isn't is social hour. You guys could call each other after the show. <laughs> no, well, we've got another show after this. The community we likes to see that we're real. That's all. Right. We're just bringing a little realness. We got four trainers in one spot actually talking to one another. That's pretty cool. <laughs> exactly. It's a Christmas miracle. I'm gonna bring back the. I'm gonna bring back the snow. There's the snow. Oh, oh not it. the snow. No. I'm making the snow. snow. Not the snow. What is the snow? What's wrong with the snow? It's so cheesy, Derek. It's so cheesy. Just say and no now, the and snow. <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to be saying? Hail, hail or snow? He's gonna oh, have like snow on. And I'm bringing the reindeers. I got a reindeer. No, it's, it. it's not even going to be not working. not even working. Don't, it don't, is. Don't I can do see it. it. It is. I can see it on the Facebook page. <laughs> and everybody's um, gone. And there, oh. <laughs> there, there, There's mistletoe. Hey, Cam, turn to your right and kiss the screen. To my right? Yeah. Yeah. See? <laughs> Gina, you got to look no. up. Look up. Gina, look up and get... Yeah, yeah, we kissed under the uh, the mistletoe. Derek, don't do anything. <laughs> do it, Derek, no. do it. <laughs> no. I did it. I did it. Too late. You can't take it back. You uh, wipe the cheek all you want. It can't happen. <laughs> all right. We got to end this broadcast. We are done. Done. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Those of you that stuck around, <laughs> I appreciate it. And God, get some awesome. pepperoni and a muzzle and uh, strap it on. All right. Have some fun tonight. <laughs> all right. We'll Bye -bye. talk to you later. Bye.